name is uh, Jason J. Rock Houston, and you're listening to Chaotic Risk Magazine. We can be found on the web at www.chaoticrisk.com. Our special guest tonight is guitarist Dan Mum. How you doing tonight, Dan? Oh, I'm doing great. How are you doing, Jason? I'm doing great. Now, um, where, are you, where are you originally from, Dan? Originally uh, from uh, the Sacramento area up in Northern California. Oh, okay, okay. And, and I was just curious. Um, I don't know how old you are, but um, being that you're from that um, part of the country, um, were you at all um, growing up influenced by Ronnie Montrose at all? Oh, I'm sorry. Could you could you say that one more time? I said, were you, um, being that you uh, are from Sacramento, I was just curious. Uh, when you were growing up, um, were you at all influenced by Ronnie Montrose? Oh, you know, a little bit, yeah. And I actually saw him play once in San Francisco. Uh, yeah, excellent player. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely, you know, uh, people are well aware of him in that area, and uh, you know, it's it's. Kind of a regular, a regular, you know, amount of conversation about him. So absolutely. Oh, cool. And um, how old were you when you um, first started playing? Uh, I started playing guitar when I was about twelve. I, I played piano originally. Uh, my mom was a piano teacher, so uh-huh. she uh, she kind of taught me and my brothers got us into music originally. But yeah, I, I picked up the guitar at twelve. I kind of. Uh, been working up to it for years. My dad played guitar, so I really mm-hmm. wanted to do that. And so, yeah, I actually got serious about it at about twelve. Yeah, that's kind of interesting because um, I know a lot of um, a lot of musicians and even guitar players. Um, one that comes to mind is Jakey Lee. Um, a lot of uh, these guys they start out on the piano and um, you know then they, they learn to play other instruments. Was that helpful to you? Start out on the um, piano and then learn out. I mean, they're two completely different instruments, but you know you're you're kind of learning an instrument at the same time. Oh, absolutely. Well, the piano is just a great instrument to start on for a lot of reasons because you know you've got all the notes just laid out right in front of you. Yeah. So it's a, it's a great way to be able to visualize certain things, especially when you're learning chords and triads and intervals and all that. It's just it's so clearly in front of you. Whereas in the guitar, it's a little bit. Well, I think it's just if you learn it on the piano first, it, it makes more sense when you learn it on the guitar. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and now um, speaking about some of your other heroes when you were growing up, who were the guys even as far as the guitar players that really um, inspired you to do what you're doing? Well, originally, I think the first uh, guitarist that really got me listen, like really thinking in terms of doing guitar solos and that kind of thing, like electric guitarist, was probably Jeff the Skunk Baxter from uh, some Steely, Dan. Steely Dan recordings. Wow, you know? wow, yeah. uh, I was a big uh, Steely Dan fan. I still am. I love Steely Dan, but a, a friend of mine, uh, his dad was a big Steely Dan guy, and so when I was really young, he got me listening to that's probably the first uh, band that I ever like really got into as a kid, and then uh, and then from there I got into the Beatles and stuff, and you know uh, George Harrison. And then I got into Metallica, you know Kirk Hammett, and all of that, and just kind of went from there. But um, yeah, I, honestly, if I if I really think about it, I probably Jeff the Skunk Baxter was the first uh, first guitarist that I ever like really listened to and thought, man, I wish I could do that. You know? now, now that that's kind of interesting because um, you know another band. I don't know if you if you've um, if you've heard. Uh, that he played with was the Doobie Brothers, and it was kind of interesting because he, he was a big part of both bands, and yet they don't really sound too much alike. No, that's true. It's true. I think he's a really versatile player, and of course, Steely Dan is such a distinctive, like, you mm-hmm. know, the kind of jazz rock kind of vibe, and uh, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. You get a, a totally different feeling between the two of them. And, and what, what's kind of interesting about both those bands is um, they're, they're uh, both bands, you know, had great songwriters. I mean, uh, Jess Gunk Baxter, um, you know, one person in both those bands, but you know, if you listen to anything either of those bands did, um, even though it's like music's like thirty, at least thirty, forty years old, um, it is really stand. All, all their songs have really stood the test of time. I mean, oh, absolutely. I mean, none of it. I mean, none of it, you can tell it came like from the seventies and eighties and that, but um, it, it doesn't sound dated really. If you know what I mean, it really holds up today. No, it's true. It's true. And, and some of the like with well, with Steely Dan, like some of their productions, just so phenomenal that i mean even today it just it still sounds as pristine as anything you'll hear i mean they're obviously not doing all the new tricks and stuff that people are doing digitally but yeah. i mean it, it, that pure analog just perfect and it, yeah it's like the music is just well i have an opinion about that too because i think you know like music evolves over time but it doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to best it you know and i think some of that music just uh, just holds up and probably will hold up you know, for, I mean, you know, we still listen to music from, you know, hundreds of years ago with yeah. classical music and stuff, you know, so I, I think some of that music's just going to hold up indefinitely. And it's kind of interesting because, you know, you'll hear a lot of people say, you know, like, rock is dead and that, rock and metal is dead. I don't necessarily agree with that. I mean, I, I think, um, just like anything, there's, there's, 
good music out there. You just got to kind of, you know, look for it. It's not, it's not maybe as readily available as it used to be. I mean, I mean, it's very hard. To, I mean, I, I can't even tell you where there's a local record store where I live. You know, <laughs> I mean, even Best Buy they stopped selling CDs and that recently. But um, you know, like I think if you're a big enough fan of the band, you, you can find a way to you know pick up their. You know, even if you have to go to the band's website, you know, to support the band, oh, yeah. it's all about um, you know supporting the bands you love. You know, absolutely, absolutely. Well, that's one of the things too with the internet now that I, I think is so fascinating is how, like, well, I mean, because it's true that from like a mainstream perspective, and maybe even from a creative perspective, like in the mainstream, yeah. with with rock or anything that's even remotely related to metal, it's not like it was when you had people where it was kind of that genuine music you know that's coming out of people and then that happens to become popular because people are you know relating to it or whatever and now it's just so commercialized but with the internet it's like you can't quite reach the same number of people that you could have in the 70s or 80s or even the 90s you know with uh, being on a record company you know record label yeah. and getting out there but there's it's just so fragmented now that there's so many tremendous musicians that have followings online or, you know, around the world, but it's not, um, you know, they'll probably never become household names, but uh, they're still doing it, you know, and I, yeah, and yeah. It, and it, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, and I, I got a whole lot of respect for those guys, because, you know, um, <clears throat> I'm still a huge music fan, and that, that's why I talk to guys like you, and um, again, it's all about supporting the, uh, you know, local musicians, trying to, um, you know, get the, get the stuff out there to the fans and stuff, but, um, oh, totally. you know, the, the other thing, too, is... Um, it's like you uh, talking about our mutual friend Maxwell Carlo. He's a very talented guitar player in his own right, and oh, absolutely, yeah. um, and he, it's just amazing what that guy's been able to do. I mean, he's got he's got he's working with some great people behind the scenes, but um, a lot of what he does is on his own. And um, he was telling me like um, he's really popular on YouTube. I mean, his YouTube channel's just taken off, and he's gotten gigs like uh, reviewing you know guitars and you know pedals and stuff for for different companies. And, and it's just amazing if, like anything I think in life, if you're dedicated, you got the talent and you work hard enough, hopefully, um, you know, you will pers persevere. <clears throat> oh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree. I agree. And with Max, it's a special case because, yeah, he does so much. I mean, him and I, he's been helping me now uh, put together music videos for for a couple of years. Um, and, I mean, he's such a creative guy. It's amazing because, uh, like, we'll be working together and I just don't even think about, like, I'm just thinking of him in terms of, like, a cinematographer, yeah. and, you know. So, you know, it's like, and he's this whole, he's a tremendous writer, songwriter, guitar player. It's, and it's he just, he's, uh, yeah, it's, it's He's a pretty uh, impressive guy to be around to work with, absolutely. And, and you know, um, it's kind of interesting to hear, like, you were influenced by a guy like uh, Jeff Gunk Baxter, because um, i seen some of your stuff on your Facebook page, and it, it's it's kind of interesting. An interesting thing to me about it is, you know, when you try to listen to players, you try to think, okay, you know, he reminds me of, you know, maybe Hendrix or Page or whoever. And um, to me, like, like listening to your stuff, first of all, I would never have guessed you list, listened to Steely Dan, which, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. And then the other thing about it is, um, the trouble I had was uh, when I'm listening to some of your stuff, Dan, was um, I was very impressed, but you know, a lot of times, again, you, you try to figure out, you know, who does this guy remind me? And I can honestly say what, what impressed me the most is um, you really, well, although you obviously got your influences, you really kind of have a sound that is all your own. I mean, it, to the sense that... I don't think anybody could, you know, accuse you of being, of being like a, you know, a Metallica clone or a Kirkhamma clone or anything <laughs> like that. You know what I mean? You, you really got yeah, your yeah, own unique you. sound. <clears throat> thank you very much. Yeah, I, I think uh, part of that is, uh, especially in recent years, but uh, I've been trying to put together a lot of different influences from all over the place, uh, and not just, you know, a lot of it too. I think I, I kind of changed my approach to writing for the guitar, yeah. which is, uh, which I think has changed the way it, you know, the the final product comes out. Because I was getting a little boxed in. I think this is a problem that a lot of guitarists run into um, where you get kind of boxed in because you build up habits of playing and those habits uh, you, know, you kind of it's just you know subconsciously you go to it and it's hard to break out of that so I try to come up with ideas of how to you know just kind of free the the melodies and stuff in my head without it being restricted to um, you know to what uh, you know what I was used to playing on the guitar but I think that uh, yeah and it's funny because I'll end up in these situations where I write something that is really weird to play you know and it takes a long time to get it down but uh, but no I'm, I'm happy with the direction it's going and I think it's uh, it's opening up some new possibilities uh, I'm excited about it now one thing that got me excited um, in setting up this interview while um, 
you and your, uh, or me and your um, publicist was, was kind of discussing getting the set up today. Um, was he, he was mentioning to me that you're currently working on a new EP and he's tell, I guess people have to go to your website and check out the discography, but he was telling me, you know, um, Dan, Dan's got a, over like 100 releases now. I was curious, um, is, is this like digital stuff? Like uh, when he says you got over 100 releases, is, is this stuff people can get digitally or do you, you've appeared on it like over 100 CDs? <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, uh, yeah, so he may have been, well, I don't know if he's exaggerating, but no, it's it's probably close to that, It's but yeah, mostly digital releases, I have a few albums out, um, he's probably th meaning like individual songs. Oh, yeah, yeah, but, 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 but even that, you know, to me, um, that's pretty impressive, because, uh, again, um, uh, when I was the point I was trying to make earlier too is a lot of you know a lot of musicians and even established bands these days um, because the music business is not what what it once was people are not buying CDs like they used to so you have a lot of right. bands that are like you know what we're not going to bother writing or recording any new music we're just going to kind of live off our catalog and um, right. it works for some bands but that's why I was saying you know guys like you um, and Max I still have a huge respect for guys that continue to put new music out. For the fans, because um, you know, with over appearing on ho over a hundred songs or whatever, that's pretty impressive. And, and you, you could be at the point where you know, I don't need to bother releasing anything new. But but I dig the fact that you're you haven't got to that point where you know you don't want to release anything new. <clears throat> right, oh, absolutely. Yeah, and I think uh, and that's the thing. Like especially with uh, being able to just put something up on Facebook or YouTube, you can release. This is I think this is one of the things that is most inspirational and, and motivational to me to keep writing music beyond just you know enjoying the process and all of that but the uh, it's that with people there who are appreciating it in the now it's like i can finish a song you know put out a video and then immediately people are able to listen to it and appreciate it and so it's just that really is and it motivates me to keep trying new things and trying to put out better products you know better end result you know better production all of that because I, I just want uh, yeah it's, it's i think it's just that it's funny because like once i finish a song i get it out there we get the video done or whatever and we put it out there's a uh, uh it's just that day of just kind of hear, hearing feedback from people and stuff and seeing, you know, uh, you know, how people are enjoying it and getting emails and stuff. And it's just so uh, gratifying for me. And then the moment that's done, like, then I just get just driven to do another one, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's like, I, I can't wait to get started on, you know, um, and, and as I'm writing it, I, I'm always thinking in terms of, you know, how somebody is going to, uh, how it's going to impact somebody. And yeah, that's kind of the hope. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm sure there'll be eventually a point where I'll want to either take a break from doing that or whatever. But right now it's, it's, um, yeah, it's just, I'm kind of hooked on that process. So the creative, know? the creative, um, juices are flowing. That, that's great. Now, um, I want to ask you too about one of those videos. Um, you got a video up for a song called The Western Wind. I was checking that out and um, the hat and that kind of remind me of Stevie Ray Vaughan. Um, cool, oh, right on, yeah. Cool looking video, but um, talk a bit Thank about you. the video itself. I was curious, um, you know, how long, did, cause again, I understand um, Max Carlisle, he, he edited or something for you, so talk a little bit about, um, you know, how long did it take the, to shoot that video and um, what the thought process was, you know, how you came up with the ideas for what the video was going to be about. Oh, sure, yeah, and, and to give Max the full credit on that, he didn't just edit it, he actually did all the, the camera work and everything on cool. that, um, yeah. and with the drone and all, I mean, he's just he, wow. the, a real multi-talented guy, but anyway, uh, yeah, so um, let me try to think back, I mean, there's some really, it's a fun story just of that of, of making the video, yeah. but um, yeah, I mean, there was kind of, uh, I think at the time, I was looking into trying something a little different, uh, I wanted to bring in kind of a theme, you know, and, uh, I, you know, who doesn't like that Western kind of vibe, you yeah. know, uh, and, and so I just was playing around with some stuff, and I came up with some ideas, some musical ideas for it, and so I started talking to Max, and, uh, and as far as, like, yeah, so really, Max, one of his other talents, one of his many talents is to, uh, he's able to find these locations, <laughs> uh, and it's, I don't know how he does it, like, every time we're working on a new video, he just, it's like I tell him what's going through my mind and then he comes back with like Google images and stuff from a uh, from a location that he's somehow found and it's just perfect you know and so this one it's like it was out in the middle of nowhere yeah, it looked like just, it yeah <laughs> yeah and somebody had made at some point uh, one of those uh, labyrinths you know um, and uh, oh it was just such a cool cool location so yeah we actually used that location again for a different video uh, but it, I mean you'd never recognize it but uh, but anyway um, 
but not with the labyrinth, right? But anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah, where was I going with that? So, uh, so yes, yeah. so, yeah, we just kind of, uh, you know, uh, came up with this idea of, you know, I'm out in the, you know, in the in the Old West or mm-hmm. whatever, I've got the, the hat, the whole thing, I come up. Yeah, you know, it's hard to say now, to remember, it's been about a year, it's okay. been over a year, but, uh, yeah, I mean, we just talked around and, and kind of visualized some things, and, it, yeah, it kind of came together very naturally, uh, but, yeah, I but the, but the actual shoot was funny because it was freezing cold. I was, out. Like, wow. Just bitter cold. Yeah. And you can kind of tell, if you see me in the video, my fingers are kind of red and my lips wow. are starting to get chapped. Uh, yeah. And it was really hard to play. Like, it was, uh, so I, we had to keep running into the car wow. know, to, to, <laughs> to warm up. And so we were out there for hours and we, we just finished up right before it started getting dark. And uh, we were out there probably like eight hours or something. Now, that, that's an interesting story right there. Now, let, which leads me to my next question. Like, when you guys pick these locations and you you're going to go out and shoot a video um, like that, do you even think ahead of time like uh, you know uh, um, to like check what the weather's going to be, or is it just kind of we'll we'll go and see see what it is and because well, we, you just never know, especially being out in the middle of nowhere, anything could could go uh, wrong, you know. <laughs> Well, and things do, and, and we've had some crazy things go wrong in the process. We do try to stay ahead of the weather, and we haven't been rained out or anything yet. Like, cause we've been real lucky, <laughs> yeah. uh, but we, we do keep track of all that. But with with that, it's like we check temperatures and stuff, and it seemed like it would be fine, but it was like the chill factor that we didn't wow, account wow. for because it was so windy. And it just, like, when we got out there and the sun was high, yeah. uh, like pretty high in the sky at that yeah. point, we're getting set up. It wasn't too bad, but then as the day progressed, it just got colder and colder. And by the time we uh, we were wrapping up, I mean, we were dying. Like, we were both, like, teeth were chattering. Like, it was out of control. And did you did you ever lose, like, the feeling in your hands or not quite <laughs> that bad? Uh, I think on that occasion, pretty close to it. I mean, we were, there must have been... A good like twenty times we had to run into the car, turn the heater on, and I had to like put my hands up to the heater. And uh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean it was it was brutal, but, I, yeah. but it, it turned out great. We were it, you know it was, it was worth it. Like, I, it was, I mean, yeah. like you said, it, the video turned out great, better than you probably expected, and and you got a great story to tell. You know, kind of. Totally. Um, and you know, the, talking about crazy weather, I tell you, man, I was coming home from work just yesterday, and um, you know, you hear these weather reports. It's, it's, it's supposed to rain, but maybe, maybe, maybe not, and. The sun is shining as bright as, as you can imagine, and, and then um, all of a sudden, for about ten minutes, just rain starts coming down like you wouldn't like you wouldn't believe. And like I said, the sun is wow. shining, and then like and then like after about five minutes, it goes away and and sun, sun the rest oh, of the day. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, man. Well, I mean, we just had uh, weather up because like, I live up in the mountains, uh, you know, down in Southern California, uh-huh. and. There was uh, uh, just, uh, you know, over February, there was yeah. that uh, all that weather, and, and I basically got snowed in here and couldn't leave for, like, a week. I mean, yeah. it was completely insane. There was no way to get in and out of the roads, and uh, my car the, uh, got uh, ice in the fuel mm-hmm. line. I never heard of this before, but condensation actually froze in the fuel line, and so it wouldn't start up. Not wow. that it would have been useful anyway, yeah, yeah. but... Uh, <laughs> But it was it was crazy. There were like icicles hanging down from my windows, like six feet long. Never seen anything like it. Probably never will again. But like uh, it was uh, it was. I mean, yeah. Like even even a few weeks thing. ago, I I heard on the news. Um, it was like um, it was like um, snowing and that in Malibu, if you can believe, light snow, light hail. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Just crazy. It's crazy. Now now um, getting back to your music. Now um, one thing that's always in, in, interested me about um. You know, listening like to instrumental guitar music, like like what you do, is um, you know it's a little bit challenging to get people to listen to f- in the first part because a lot of people are typically used to listening to um, you know music that has vocals, and, whereas a lot of like what you do is based more on I would I would I don't know if you would agree. It seems like it's based more on a on a feeling or an emotion. Where um, sure, yeah. whereas a song with vocals, <laughs> you're kind of telling a story, and it's easier for people to figure out what the song's about. So. Like um, when you when you when you're writing, I, I was kind of cu- uh, curious, Dan. Um, um, do you typically get? Um, does it depend like what you like if you're feeling happy or whatever, or just do you think of a certain topic that's on your mind? What's your writing process like? Yeah, so uh, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I I have kind of some different processes I've worked on to try to kind of tap into inspiration. I guess is the way I look at yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's it's definitely based on a feeling of some kind. I, I think there's like different facets to it because at one level I kind of want to express something you know it seems like um, I have this theory or way of looking at things where music is a means of expressing things that you can't really express otherwise yeah yeah 
And so, yeah, so it's like, there's, you know, there's maybe something that I want to try to express in that way, but I also want to make something that's going to be fun and entertaining and, um, and that I would want to listen to, you know, and that would be, um, you know, it's kind of exciting. It keeps you interested in it and it's, uh, and you want to hear it again. And so there's kind of different, like I, they kind of have like the raw feeling that I bring to the table and then and then I try to build something around that that is uh, you know that takes that and presents yeah. it in a way that's that's a fun package and, and really enjoyable as enjoyable and you know try to you know as exciting as it can be and, and that kind of thing so um, if, I don't know if that makes sense oh yeah yeah and, and I, I totally could follow that for a simple fact that again see that's that's a thing when, when you um, are, when you're creating instrumental music too um, even just for people to listen to um, you got to be able to keep their attention. I mean, I mean, um, I'm I'm a big fan of um, like the shred type music from the '80s, but but totally. the problem for a lot of those uh, a lot of those um, you know shred albums is like a lot of times you, you get an album where all ten songs sound the same. Where sure. you might get a guy like Satriani or Steve Vai, where you know you can hear the melody and they're playing it, and not not all not all ten songs on the album uh, sound the same. Steve Vai is a, a great. A great example of that. I mean, even if you um, go back to the David Lee Roth album, Meet Him and Smile, do you remember the song oh, yeah, y- Yankee yeah. Rose? Do you remember? I mean, it's oh, amazing. Absolutely. I mean, th- that song did have vo- vocals, but it- it's amazing that um, the way, you know, Steve was able to make his guitar talk, you know, like, hello, David, and, and all that stuff. And even if you listen to, like, his stuff off of uh, Passion and Warfare, that's one of his solo albums, um, yeah. you know, um, that was pr- pretty much just instrumental music, and he had some of him talking through it, but... I'll never forget seeing the um, video for his song, The Audience is Listening, and again, he just somehow ma- was able to make his guitar talk, you know? And no, it's true. <laughs> he's, he's such a talent at that. It's amazing. Like, uh, and it's true. Like, you, every song you hear from Steve Vai is a, it's a song in itself. It's not just like a place to showcase technique or whatever. And, there, and not that I think there's anything wrong with that, but no, you no, find no. that, especially for the average listener, it, and especially if someone's not a guitarist or they're not like a serious guitarist, then you know it's a much uh, it's something that you, it's music you're going to put on to listen to. It piques your interest. It gets your interest yeah. at, at the very least, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. And you remember the melodies yeah. and stuff like it sticks with you. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. And so let me let me ask you. Getting back to you know starting out, you know being influenced very early on by a guy like um, Jeff Scott Baxter, and then you said later on you were influenced by guys like Kirk Hammett. So. Once, totally. you, once you start getting into metal music, did you um, did you see your um, playing change really really much? I mean, uh, even as a player, I think um, you know, like those, just those two um, influences they're so far apart, you know. Right. Well, it's well, I, I have a really eclectic music taste in general, and I think uh, I kind of go through phases with listening mm-hmm. to music, and I think my guitar. Uh, playing went through phases as well over since the time I started playing. So when I first started playing, I was mostly just like playing the Beatles and maybe a little bit of stuff that was on the radio or whatever. But you know, I time. think I think that makes you a much better rounded musician for the simple fact, like a lot of those early bands you, you said you were influenced by. Um, yeah, they were pretty much all those guys were, were, were great songwriters, and, and even even though like okay, the Beatles are not metal or um, you know they're just. It's great pop candy, if you know what I mean. I mean, all, all, all the so- I mean, you hear all the songs on the radio forty years later. Th- these are songs that, like we're saying, stood the test of time. And the fact that, like, um, you know, you listen to bands like that, and maybe you're into Metallica at the same time. You know, it, it also makes it easier as a musician for you to get gigs. Maybe, maybe there's a Beatles cover band or something that needs um, somebody to come down and uh, play guitar. I mean. Um, oh, for sure. And and even uh, like if you get a gig like um, somebody wants you to play on a soundtrack or something, um, you can do various different types of music. So um, I have all respect in the world for people that. And again, even me, I'm that way as far as listening to music. I mean, <clears throat> I'm as big a fan of you know the Eagles and Tom Petty as I am of you know White Snake and Aerosmith. I I mean to me it's just oh, sure. it's just great music, you know. Totally. <clears throat> No, I, I mean, I, I'm right there with you on that, yeah. No, and I, and I think you're right. I think, uh, I think it really does help, especially from a songwriting perspective. Um, because one of, the, one of the things that, especially when I was younger, I, I, when I was first playing in bands, like in high school and stuff, and, uh, you know, it was really cool. Like, I, I you know, kind of meet other bands in the area, and, uh, and it was a lot of just tremendous musicians. But one of the things I noticed was when you get into, like, a scene, and I don't want to sound like I'm... I'm saying this in any disparaging way or not because yeah. uh, you know, i'm not but it's you know the, the music t- starts to tend to sound very similar to one another yeah. you know, 
And so, and the reason is, is because, you know, in a genre, you have staples of the genre, certain chord progressions, certain, you know, stylistic choices and, and beats and things like that. And so you, and it, that kind of gets refined over time and you end up with something really cool. Uh, but it's, uh, it's not as, um, uh, well, it's, you know, it's very precise. It's very specific yeah, in the yeah. area. And so, like, for me, being kind of a more eclectic taste person, I, I really wanted to, it's like, I'd love this about this style, yeah. but I also love this about that style, and I kind of wish that they would meet. So I was always, you know, I mean, YouTube wasn't around at the time, but if it was, it probably would have been a great time to do this sort of thing, but I always imagined, like, what would this sound like if you took this element and put it over there, you know, um, and uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's I think that that really helped me just, um, you know, as, as a musician in the sense yeah. of, like, learning a lot of different types of uh, techniques and, you know, writing techniques and, you know, co different types of chord progressions and how that kind of stuff works. Uh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? I, yeah, I mean, it, it's amazing. I mean, you take a, um, you take a guitar player such as Eddie Van Halen, you know, gr a great, very uh, huge talent, but um, people would be amazed to learn that as talented as he is, um, he cannot read a lick of music, but yeah, look at what he does, you know? Oh, totally. And, and that's totally. why, you know, there's, there's two, um, like you're saying, there's two avenues of guitar players. I mean, there, there are these guys that they, they can shred with the best, and I mean, Ink Fay Mal seems a great example of that. I mean, you got Absolutely. you got a player like Tony McAlpine, a huge talent yeah. in, in his own right, but yet he's one of these guys that you know, um, you know, he's very precise in playing everything, you know, just just so. But then there, there's a certain um, I have a certain love too for guys that can kind of just um, you know go off, and it's not so much about being precise, but just kind of having a good time, you know, and you know, and, and again, the songs have melody in that, you know, and sound good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh no, I agree. I, well, yeah, I think I think, and all those things are different elements that are cool for their own reasons. Yeah, yeah. And enjoyable for different reasons. And yeah, I, like I think, uh, yeah, maybe that's just part of my personality. But it's hard for me to pick favorites with that kind of thing. Yeah, you know? yeah. Like, <laughs> but uh, you know, you have kind of people who are purists and just like stick to one side, yeah. like like listeners who are just or players or whatever, and this is what they want to do, which is great because then they can really refine it and master whatever that particular thing is but um but yeah I, I, maybe it's just my attention span is kind of short but i i like to well, have, see, you know yeah. hear different stuff you know uh, like uh, you know what i'm saying yeah that's the whole thing i mean e even um when you go see some of these guitar players you know perform in concert a fa fact that you have a guy like tony mcgalpine that can get up for for an hour and a half and um entertain if you know what i mean and oh, people yeah. are, and people aren't walking out because again it takes a certain level of talent to Get up there, and you know it's a, quite a different uh, experience going to see you know maybe just one guy on stage, um, you know strumming the guitar, doing doing his thing, and um, as opposed to having a, ba a whole a band of four or five guys up there, you know. So it, it is quite a different experience, and if um, you can keep the audience um, entertained and keep their attention, that 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 shows you know that you got some talent there. Oh, for sure, for sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you know, I will. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of diverge here for a second because there's something interesting. I think uh, that what I can talk about on this subject. Sure. But, uh, you know, I, for a while I did. I was doing. This is something that I just had wanted to do for years, and I, I took about maybe two or two years or so to really focus on taking classical music and doing metal interpretations of them. You know, for uh, basically like take the song and then convert it to like what it would sound like if it was written for a metal band. You know. Oh, uh, that's, that's and, interesting. That's interesting. Um... Yeah, I mean, a great example of that is um, Richie Blackmore from uh, Deep Purple. I mean, um, for the last several years, he's had this um, band Blackmore's Night with his um, wife, and it sounds nothing like Deep Purple or Rainbow. And um, and for several years, I was kind of like without. I was kind of like a lot of these people without even hearing. Oh, you know, okay, he's playing folk music. I'm not really into that. But then um, his publicist sent me a copy of his uh, CD at the time, and I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll give us a fair listen. And, and, and yeah, admittedly, it wasn't Deep Purple, but you know, I said this this isn't half bad. And and I think if a lot of people just kind of give stuff like that a, a listen, they might be surprised that it's not half bad. But you know, even guys like um, Blackmore and Ink, they uh, you hear them all the time talking about how they were inspired by you know neoclassical music. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I you know, and I haven't heard uh, uh, Blackmore's Night. You said yeah, it, it, Night. Like uh, it, it, um, I think it's a K and I. You can look it up okay. and. You can look it on the yeah. internet or YouTube, I'm sure um, a ton of stuff will come up, or just type in Richie internet. Blackmore. Yeah, yeah, oh, well, that's, yeah, I mean, I love Richie Blackmore, and, I have to check that and, out. And, and again, yeah, just, and his, his, his wife, his wife um, is the singer, and so again, it, it's quite different sounding, but um, oh, wow. but it, it's, it's quite unique at the same time, I think, um, based on what you're telling me, I think you'll have an appreciation for it. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, I, I'm sure I will. I'm sure I will. Um, but yeah, I wanted to, to make a little point with the classical thing because I was uh, I was doing that you know for a while, and I, I love that music. Like I have a deep appreciation for it, um, and so it was really enjoyable for that reason. But when I was performing some of the pieces, which are you know written for the violin, they're yeah. extremely difficult technical pieces, and you have to get it just right and like one of the things about it is uh, you know like uh, like Paganini for example you might have you know I did his fifth caprice uh -huh. and it's really long and it never actually repeats so there's all this memorization I basically have to practice it like every day and then you go on stage and play and it to me it just wasn't fun like I'd be up there yeah. just focused on it's like I couldn't be rocking out at all I couldn't yeah, yeah. be like interacting with the audience and I did a lot of performances like that, and I finally just decided that I'm not going to do that anymore because, I mean, there's certain songs I'd still throw yeah, in, yeah. you know, but the really, really technical ones, it's, I mean, some, I, I have a lot of respect for guys who do that and just, like, that's what they do performance-wise, but I think just for me it was, like, uh, it was just too much concentration, yeah. and I think, um, you know, it's one of the reasons I've, I've kind of adjusted from doing a lot more of the technical stuff in my music because I want to be able to rock out a little more yeah. you know and, and get into it a little more and not be well i think it was that i wasn't as present of mine i was it was kind of just you know in the zone of trying to to stay on top of what i was playing and i think it's uh, uh you know and i know there are some tremendous players and violinists who just get this stuff down to where yeah. they're not even thinking about it, they're just feeling it you know and i never quite got to that point but uh, now let me but, ask yeah. you, you 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 bring up like the violin now um i don't know if you've heard of this guy um, he was known for years. I don't. I think he's still around. You can look him up too on um, probably Facebook and YouTube. Um, they they had this guy known as a metal violinist, Mark Wood. Have you ever heard of him? You know, I haven't. I am a big violin fan. I'm gonna have to check him out. Yeah, yeah, and it's kind of kind of interesting too because, like you're saying, typically you think um, metal violin. I I don't know about that, but um, it, it just this guy really goes off, and it's instrumental stuff. But it, it's um, it's like nothing you've ever heard in a good way. <laughs> Right on, man. Well, that sounds phenomenal. Yeah, and he's another guy that kind of like you has got a lot of. Um, uh, probably if you you know type in Mark Wood and you'll you'll find a lot of sites that you can go to, and he's got several releases. And you know, uh, talking about uh, guitar players too, another great ex example. One of my uh, um, heroes is Marty Friedman. I mean, if you look what he, I mean, when he got his start, he started out with Jason Becker, a huge talent in his own right. But um, oh, for sure. And, and you know, um, Marty, well, look what he did in Megadeth. And then he left Megadeth and went on to a bigger career, if you can even believe that. I mean, he's lived like for the past 20 years in Japan, from what I understand. Became a huge pop star in Japan. He, he appears on TV all the time. He, he, he lives there, from what I understand. And, and he can speak fluent Japanese. Just, just wow. amazing, you know? That's awesome. But people are able to do with the guitar if they got that talent, you know? Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's incredible. And, and uh, I was curious, like... Um, Talk about different styles of playing. Are you a fan of like, um, you know, unplugged or acoustic guitar playing? Oh, oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I don't do much of that myself professionally, but yeah. I keep an acoustic around at all times. I'm yeah. always kind of jamming around. But no, I, I love that kind of thing. I especially enjoyed, uh, you know, probably back in the '90s, they had all those unplugged concerts. Oh yeah, I mean, like, I mean, you know, like Kiss and Tesla. But and but yeah. the, but the great thing about the, those, like for example, is. Um, before all those, you know, before the unplugged thing became huge back back then, a lot of people had a different. Um, they'd hear acoustic, they oh, acoustic that that's boring, that sucks. But it, it shows you what it shows you, uh, you know, Kiss or Tesla, two great bands that shows you what you can do. Or, you know, a lot like uh, the guys in Kiss would say, well, you know, this is how you write a song. This is how the songs usually start out. But but again, if you listen to like the electric version versus. The acoustic version drastically different, you know. And oh, yeah. um, I was recently well, almost like yeah. yeah, you're in the new song, but it's still the song you you like, you know. Yeah, it's I mean, a great example like of that is um, I went online recently and I was um, researching stuff on Molly Crew because they have a movie coming out um, tomorrow. But but anyways. Um, oh, cool! I did, yeah, I didn't know about that. On, on Netflix, that. if you get Netflix, it's called The Dirt, and it's kind of based on their book. Um, but it's coming out tomorrow on Netflix, so I'm kind right. of excited about that. But but anyways. Um, I, I came across this version um, of the Motley Crue song Livewire Nicky Six did with his other band, 6AM, kind of an acoustic version, and, and, it, and it almost sounds like a, a ballad type song. It sounds nothing like the original Livewire, which is just a, another example of, um, if you've got any kind of talent, what you could do with a song. Oh, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to have to check that out, too. Yeah, uh, yeah. And <laughs> now, now, talk, now, I was kind of um, interested, like... Um, 
talk a little more about your inspiration and your writing. Like, like you've done like a, maybe close to a hundred of these songs we've talked about. Now, um, when when you get the inspiration, do you just kind of like you got a home studio? Do you just go in and rec do you typically like record one or like two or three songs at a time, or just kind of um, when when you get an idea or something? <clears throat> so yeah, so I, yeah, I've got a, a home studio set up. It kind of takes up the, a huge part of my my house because uh, you know it's where I like to spend most of my time if I can. But, yeah, yeah, I, I will come in and just uh, you know um, depending on what I'm trying to do because I, I write a lot of music that I don't plan to release just yeah. for fun. I've been, yeah, yeah. I've been you know working with analog synthesizers just over the last year. I just brought that in, so I've written a ton of songs just with the synthesizers. But you know they're not polished or anything. Just yeah, yeah, having fun, but. Um, but yeah, so uh, but when I'm really trying to write a song, you know, like like, like you know, prof for professional reasons, yeah. uh, you know, I'll, I'll like like I was saying before, have kind of a, a general idea and coming into it. And now what I normally do, yeah, I get really focused just on that song. So I will uh, kind of uh, kind of try to get the fire going. Yeah. I guess would be a good way to put it. So I'll I'll come in and just kind of hash out some ideas and just try to figure out, you know, maybe find the melody first or find some element that uh, is somehow representative of what I'm trying to you know, get out of my head. and uh, Or sometimes I'll just hear a melody and then you know, do that and then go from there. But once I, I get the first couple elements together that really click in the way I like, then I just get, I'll just kind of clear my calendar for a couple days, you know, and get completely lost in getting it all started. And then, um, and then I'll, you know, then I'll just kind of keep refining it from there. But yeah, I usually get very, very uh, Intense. focused. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, now, let me ask you. So, like, typically when you go in the studio, do you already have an idea in your um, head how the how you want the song to sound, or typically does it start with you kind of just um, playing and seeing where it takes you? Well, I, that, the playing and seeing where, where it takes me was something I did for years, and I think now, more recently, it's more about there's some idea that I have, and it's it's usually like. Again, it's like a few elements. It's mm -hmm. like some kind of feeling I'm trying to express, some kind of feeling I want the audience to take away from it, and then also just kind of, I don't know if there's a way to put this clearly, like um, where it's like there's a certain type of flow to the song or yeah, a certain yeah. type of vibe, and, and like th those things are kind of in my imagination, and so I have kind of a, I know what it's, what it's supposed to sound like. So like when I start coming up with something that isn't right, I know right away that that's not that's not it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Now, now let me ask you, um, if we were walking to your studio now, like, um, I would imagine, um, uh, like you say, you, you got tons of, like, unreleased stuff. Like, like, is there a, is there a, a Dan Mum uh, vault of, like, unreleased stuff? <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, yeah. There's, a riff? Got, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's all on hard drives. Yeah. Yeah, there's probably, I, I couldn't even tell you. <laughs> couldn't even, I couldn't yeah. even guess. And now, so, a, a lot of this stuff, obviously, um, it's, for you know your own song ideas, but um, do you ever get creative or write stuff for other people? Uh, I've done a few things like that. Um, a couple times, people have hired me to write songs for them, but like in an uncredited mm -hmm. kind of way, um, and I, it's not really my cup of tea. Doing Which I, that, I could kind of see why, because yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, and I've done some music for. Uh, like just yeah let me try to think like like really random stuff to mm -hmm. people i know you know like where it's like hey they're i'm doing this project or as a friend you know, thing yeah yeah exactly and then um uh you know so I, I i've got music out there in that way i uh but uh yeah i mean mostly for the most part uh it's more of a personal thing where it's more about me just kind of yeah. i've got something i want to put out so i'm uh but no i'm, I'm definitely open to that i enjoy tr those different challenges because in those cases people wanted something in a certain style and it was something very different than what i normally do and so that was fun because then i researched the style and kind of you know learn about that and that's really just useful for me yeah. as a musician you know to, to do and it, it you know it's fun so yeah so i like doing things like that for yeah have you ever time. collaborated with anybody in the sense of like um like kind of um i don't know done, done like a a live show with another another guitar player and have him like play on one of your tracks or you guys kind of um play off one another or something like that like a guitar yeah. duo 
Yeah, there's been a couple times. The most recent, because I haven't been doing a lot of live performance over the last couple of years. Uh, uh, I, I, I plan to do like a tour, but I, the EP release, which we, we can talk about maybe a little yeah, more. Yeah, 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 that, that's what uh, we're going to get into now. So Yeah, uh, but I'll, to answer your question, though, like, but that's going to be kind of like part of a big push to move back into performance again. But uh, but yeah, recently, last year I did a, uh, a show. It was actually, it was supposed to be a... Um, like a live stream show for Grease and Custom Guitars, who, oh. who makes the Dan Mum guitar. Okay. And uh, and so yeah, at the time, like the, the live stream was an utter disaster, unfortunately. And so it really didn't. Uh, it didn't. It just didn't pan out because of technical difficulties, which obviously can happen. The only good thing uh, about that is you live and learn, right? So you know, you yeah, know what not to do. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But the but uh, uh, but there was a good audience there, like like a pretty good crowd at where we were playing. And so um, and Max Carlisle came with me. Uh, to that and we were uh, talking about various uh things we were working on together uh, also maybe him doing something with grease and guitars at some point but but yeah he actually came along and so we did uh he we both played like he played and then i played but in between we played um a bunch of songs together so uh yeah it was basically what you're saying we just kind of uh, we did a couple things that max had just written like he had put together a backing track package he was selling online for people to jam with wow. and so we played on a bunch of those they're just phenomenal all these different styles are just tremendous uh, and so we had a lot of fun with that and then yeah i think we might have jammed on a couple other songs uh you know it's been a while now uh, but it was something like that but yeah it was a lot of fun and uh, back in the day there were various uh, occasions what where you, you know someone someone would come on stage or something that i knew or whatever and jump in uh, but uh, yeah again like it's been a while since i mean really over like the last five years most of the performances i've done have been like you know at guess, nam or something you know not, so yeah. it's you know what I'm saying, uh, now, but okay. I mean, yeah. yeah. Now, getting in, get, um, I do definitely want to talk about your EP you're working on now. Um, is this something that you're just beginning to work on? Have you been working on it for a while now? Do we have a release date? You know, maybe sometime oh, this year. Yeah, so it's it's a little over half done, I would say at this point. Um, and actually, a couple of the songs that are going to be on it are already out, which are wow. "Speed of Change" and "Hide Inside," which we just put out like maybe a week ago. Wow. Um, and uh, and anyway, yeah. So uh, yeah, it's it's it, I, it's something that I've been kind of ramping up to for a while, and uh, and so I really wanted to try to get uh, you know because I've been taking different elements of different genres and kind of trying different things, and I really wanted to try to just go all the way with that for an EP where the whole EP is is like that and uh, and trying these new ideas um, and then just produce it as best as I because I do all my own production and, and I've been really ramping that up over the last year so I'm trying to just you know get it to sound as be, you know as clear as crisp as, as powerful as, as I can mm -hmm. and so yeah so I, I, I'm you know I'm, I now I've got basically just a couple a few more songs uh, two and a half songs to, to complete for it but um, I'm hoping at some point probably in the middle of 2019 probably over the summer it'll actually be out um, and ready to go and i plan to do a lot to to get it out there um and that's something that's actually one of the reasons too why uh uh you know uh, my uh, publicist contacted you because i'm doing uh, you know i normally don't i haven't done interviews like this very much yeah. at all like I, you know and so i really wanted to get out and you know Practice, these are things yeah. i've been neglecting and yeah. i need to you know like uh, uh get out there and, and you know talk to people and and uh, you know get the word out so so yeah so it's it's but i'm really excited about it it's it's something uh, it's some new ideas on there and uh, i'm just trying to put do the very best that i can on it uh, yeah. so yeah. yeah but anyway you don't need, you know, you don't need my advice to me telling you what to do, but it sounds like you're on a great start for a simple fact. I would dig like a CD like that, you know, even if it's like five or six tunes where, you know, like each, each tune kind of has its own um, influence. I mean, for, you know, you, you, like if you had a, ball, a ballad track on there, maybe even you have another tune that's kind of rock and then hits people over the head. Um, totally. A little, a little something for everybody. And, and then even when you go out to perform these tunes, um, it makes it that much more interesting for the audience because um, it's a little, again, a little something for everybody. Totally. Well, that's kind of part of my thinking on it, too, is just kind of expand out, you know, a little bit so, yeah, more people can appreciate it and uh, and get into it. And it's and while there's going to be a lot of interesting guitar work on it, and, uh, and one of the things I always release the tabs for the songs that I do so, you know, guitarists can, can learn them, but um, the, and there's going to be a lot of cool uh, guitar work that will be fun to learn, but it's not going to be as guitar focused where it's more uh you know it's more about 
the listening experience than just the guitar work. Uh, you know, although there you know are solo like solos in the song specifically to just yeah. have fun with the guitar, but uh, but yeah, it's uh, you know it's it's a little bit different than stuff I've done in the past, yeah. but um, yeah, yeah, but ex- yeah, what you said, it's you I know mean, maybe hopefully a little yeah. more accessible. That's, that's um, one thing I loved about a lot of the '80s rock bands. I mean, you always had great like all the great bands had a guitar hero, uh, you know, totally. And um, that's the thing I miss. A lot of these bands are like, oh, we don't. You know, we don't do solos. I'm like, well, why not? You know, <laughs> right? I know. What What was that? Yeah, I know, and, man. <laughs> and um, you know, now um, would you be releasing this like independently, or do you hope to like, um, you know, send it out and see if lab- any labels bite? <laughs> Uh, right now, I still I, I just kind of stick with the independent thing. I I hope to actually stay independent uh, indefinitely. I, I just prefer it that way. I think, I think it's a smart but, move because you know um, the the one thing is um, I mean a couple years back, but to me the record industry really screwed itself because um, yeah I mean it, it's great if because um, otherwise um, if you sign with a label as great as um, that might be, um, they typically end up getting the bulk of the. Of the pie, if you know what I mean. You're making all, oh yeah. You're making all the music and and you're creating and writing all this great stuff and and they're getting um they're getting rich off of what you're doing. And um on the flip side, you know as much um you know being an independent artist, it's a l- little more um, tougher financially. But at the same time, you know if your music sells and you know enough people out there buying it, you know you 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 um you end up reaping all the rewards if you know what I mean. Oh, absolutely. Well, I do think uh, there's different angles to that, especially yeah. now with the internet. I yeah. think, yeah, I, yeah. I, yeah, I've crunched the numbers, and at least, I mean, it depends on what the record label did for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, but being that, uh, you know, being kind of a niche artist and stuff, if I was on a label, I probably would have to work a day job. Yeah, but yeah, by yeah, being yeah. independent, I'm actually making enough to, I'm, I'm doing fine, you know, so it's like, it's you know I have other products and stuff that I sell you know like instructional things and all of that that kind of supplement everything. But if that was all through you know um, well I mean I I, I do uh, lessons with Metal Method as well, uh, which I don't know if you're familiar with. Oh Doug yeah, Marks, you know, Metal um, Method, it, it's kind of interesting because um, I remember seeing that guy Doug Marks back in you know when I was growing up like in the eighties. Yeah, me these, too. Yeah, these yeah, metal and guitar like world Circus magazine and Hitler, oh, yeah. Metal Edge and. You know, he kind of looked like Dana Strum from Slaughter, but but um, totally. But but it's kind of amazing. He had this band, you know, named Hawk, and um, I actually did an interview recently with his um, ex-wife talking to her about how um, they started Metal um, Metal Method and all that. And, and it's kind of interesting. He had a band that he played in with, and some of the guys that were in the band were like uh, Lonnie Vincent from The Bullet Boy, Scott Travis from Judas Priest, and I think even Matt Sorum was a drummer at one point, and. Um, yeah, and, and, right. and the band didn't end up, you know, they even played um, on the Sunset Strip, but they didn't really break out in a big way. And he, he ended up making all his money with the Metal Method thing. And, 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 and it seems kind of, um, people might be surprised, that, you know, he was the first guy to really do that. I mean, you have all these other lessons now, but I mean, back in the day, he got to start like, you know, they were audio uh, audio tapes, and then they moved to, yeah. and they started making DVDs and, and stuff. So, yeah, I'd be interested in hearing how you, you, know, how you hooked up with that, and um, that's a in- very interesting story. Yeah, well, Doug is a great guy, and, and just to put a cap on the thing I was saying before, which is, uh, you know, that's kind of the only non-independent thing I do, and, it's, and Doug is, you know, such a great guy to work with, and we have a great arrangement so it's not like uh what you'd normally have in one of those situations yeah. but um but yeah doug actually contacted me like i think it was back in 2010 wow um yeah you know, there's a video i had put up um and uh i mean he's been a tremendous help to me through my career on a lot of a lot of fronts but uh yeah i, I put a i put a video out i think it was an original song it was the point of no return it was the first video i did for that song uh, and the uh and so there's some like uh, eight finger tapping guitar work in there, and so that had caught his attention. And he had sent me an email. And we started talking. And he was interested in the technique and maybe me doing a lesson through Metal Method, teaching that sort of thing. So at the time, it was like you know, the, I mean, it was it just blew my mind. You know, wow. so I was yeah. I was just like you know, give me two weeks. I'll do it in two weeks. Like <laughs> I, I'm just gonna I'll drop everything yeah. and make the best lesson I can. And so I just got as dedicated as I could and, and just put my all into coming up with something as, you know, as best as I could. And so anyway, then we started, a, we've got a great, uh, you know, professional relationship. He's also a good friend of mine. And uh, yeah, we've been working together on various things um, for all this time now. Um, but yeah, yeah, Doug's a great guy and uh, really enjoy, uh, uh, you know, having done these projects. Yeah, we're still working on stuff together. I'm doing, um, 
some uh, I'm writing some articles and stuff right now about about you know motivation as a, to, you know for practice like oh, practice wow. techniques things like that and getting that out to the uh, you know the metal method users you know the um, uh, that's, that doesn't sound right but you know the, uh, yeah, yeah, the yeah, students yeah. right the students wow, uh, wow that's a, that's amazing you know um, wow wow I, I know I had no idea about that now um, now you you are very successful like um, you know solo artist in your own right but let, let me ask you Dan. Um, um, what made you go that route as opposed to like a lot of guys wanting to, you know, uh, like be in a band and that, you know, where, where, you know, like typical band again with the singer, bass player and drummer? <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that's, that is a question I, I'm looking, I enjoy answering. Yeah, uh, it's a good question because I, I did that for a long time. I mean, oh. that was my original route. Yeah, yeah. And I actually used to sing in a band and oh, I was, yeah. you know, played guitar and sang and like in a number of bands back, like way back in the day. And what actually got me on the course that I'm on now, and it's not to say that I'm not going to do a band in the future because I, I, I definitely would like to at some point uh, yeah. with vocals and everything. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, what happened was I think it was just I did the band thing for a long time, and, and you probably know how that goes. It's pretty, you know, you start getting all this momentum, and then yeah. a member quits, yeah, or yeah, yeah. you know, something happens. It just you know you got to then get somebody new. You've got to you know take a hiatus from all the shows you have booked, and it just it becomes a, a huge know, headache. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so there, you kind of just have to rely on these people. And there were certain musicians. There's a drummer uh, who I'll name, yeah. uh, Jim Boots. We used to call him Evil Jim. Tremendous, one of the best drummers in Sacramento. And and uh, we played uh, together uh, probably like ten years in various bands and stuff. But um, so you find you find people like that, and you 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 you, know, you stay with them, you know, because it's yeah. like they're reliable. Excuse me, they're reliable. They're you know, they have the same kind of goals that you do. Um, and a lot of the musicians I play with are just tremendous musicians, great guys and gals as in some cases and uh, but you know you kind of end up with a different direction or something so it just it, it's hard to keep that together and so yeah. on top of that you're trying to build momentum you're trying to get the word out you're trying to you know it, and it's like you have so little control over it's like you want to get recorded uh, at least back then so you'd have to get all this money together and then you've got to find like a cheap you know, recording studio is probably not going to be that great. Yeah. Uh, you get a cheap mix that's probably not going to be, you know, it's like, it's, so finally it just hit me one day. It's like, you know, this is what I intend to do. I mean, I've always intended to do. Yeah. And it's like, how can I have the most control over my success? I, I hear you. you know? I hear you. Because you again, when you're playing with the bands, then um, oftentimes the thing called ego gets in the way. Whereas, you know, um, you know, right. you, you might have one guy that thinks, you know, he, he should call the shots or whatever. And, and and you know just turmoil or whatever so um i'd imagine too now i i didn't know you sang that um i was i was curious um did you sing out of necessity in the sense that um um like a lot of people when you when you were starting out um you just didn't think um you know maybe other people could sing your material the way you wanted it i mean i've heard for example dave mustaine you know he, he got his start in um metallica and then when he um i heard him in an interview say that um like when he was starting um, Megadeth, he originally intended to get a, a, a singer, but all the guys he auditioned, he just could not think, he did not think that they could sing his material the way he wanted it to be performed. Was that kind of um, your story there, or did you have a different story? Well, for, yeah, it's probably, it's, I think that might be somewhere on the lines, but also, I, did, I actually did theater a lot as a kid, like musical theater, uh -huh. not a lot of people know that, wow. uh, you know, uh, but, uh, so I did a lot of singing growing up, and uh, and so I was always singing as a kid, so yeah, it just, it was kind of a natural thing, like I don't know, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly, so it just kind of made sense at the time, I don't know, looking back at some of the old recordings, um, I, I don't think I was singing poorly, but I think that the style of singing that I was doing uh. didn't necessarily match the music all that well, uh, and that would have been something that if I was coaching that person yeah. today, I'd, I'd try to maybe you know bring them toward, more towards yeah. something that fits the music a little better. But no, I, I think it was just I love singing, so well, that's good. Was, yeah. you, know, well, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I mean, I do think there's a certain um, thing about um, you, you do have some of these guys who are you know not like the world's greatest singer, but um, when you hear them sing their stuff, you know, there's a certain thing about they have the ability because they wrote it to um, sing it with a little more heart than somebody that didn't, if you know what I mean. And it's, sure. it still comes across as, you know, a decent song where it doesn't, you know, hurt theirs or anything. And a lot of times right. we're, we're our own worst critics, you know. I mean, even people when they, you know, go into a recording studio and they hear their, you know, their speaking voice for the very first time, oh, wow, I sound like that. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's true. Well, that's true. Yeah, I, I think that... Uh, the way that I was singing back then, there was it was definitely well. We had a really like, like one of the bands we worked on, 
which was called Mortal Despair. Yeah. Uh, and that was, uh, uh, yeah, I think that uh, uh, we had a pretty good following in Sacramento for, for a while. I mean, we, that band lasted for a number of years, but uh, and we got, we done pretty well. And I think there was kind of a, a, a split on people who really liked the way I sang and people who didn't like the way I sang. And so we had fans who loved the band uh-huh. and were like, would like, frequently suggest to me you know, you should consider getting another singer you know get a singer in yeah. there and then other fans who would be like man I, your voice is really unique and you know i really like the way you sing and you know blah 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 and so you know i, I think at the time and i mm. probably had a bigger ego then than i have yeah. now i just kind of let it all ro- roll off you know because yeah. well, that, that's doing. cool too but, but you know um you know another thought process would be, maybe be where like again um you probably have a certain talent as a singer to be able to sing your, you know, stuff you write. Now, um, what I've always loved like about a band like Kiss is the fact that you you have a band where you have more of an, you know, um, you have two lead singers in the band. Um, so when you put on the records, you're not always hearing the same guy. So you know, you right. can maybe do something like that where you, you sing some half the stuff. You have another guy that sings, you know, the other half of the stuff. I mean, I've always loved bands like that. I mean, even even band uh, a great band. Uh, that did that was like the Eagles. You, you have all these guys in the oh, band that yeah. to sing and write, and I mean, even the drum, even, e- even the drummer, you know, sings. It's just amazing. Well, I mean, you know, it's funny. I actually, and this is probably one of the biggest regrets I have doing bands is that I had a. Uh, well, I don't know if there was much I could do about it, but there was a band that I had uh, put together with a couple guys, you know, a few guys, uh-huh. uh, and uh, I mean, we all put it together, and uh, we we called it. It was called Bad Apple. I think there's now another band with that name, but uh-huh. uh, but we had called it that, and it was it was kind of um, it was different than what I normally did. But every member of the band sang, and uh, including the drummer. And the music was probably the most fun music that I ever played in a band. And we mm. only played one show, and then the band fell apart. There were people just weren't getting along. And, wow, wow. And it was, and it was yeah. such a shame, because we we'd written like 12 songs. Yeah. And some of that, like even now, like when I can find the old CD of it, it's just fun music to listen to. And it's really, it's, it's a little silly. It's a little like yeah. humorous, you know. Um, it's kind of, it's a little punk. It's a little, um, you know, oh. something like that, metal, wow, you know, wow. kind of. But it's yeah, it's a little more raw sounding. But man, was it fun! And uh, it's just, I think it's a shame that we weren't able to, to do more with that. But uh, but yeah, I'm with you on the multiple vocals vocalist thing. I think and, and there's so many more opportunities for dynamics and like harmonies and just yeah, different sounds. A singer for a certain song that's better suited to that. Yeah, yeah I mean, you even song. take a band, you know, like Van Halen. I mean, um, Michael Anthony, the original bass player. I mean, he was a huge part of that sound. I mean, just his background vocals. It's amazing, you know. You take him oh, yeah. out of a band, and it's amazing, you know, how, how drastically different the band sounds. No, it's true. It's, it, that's absolutely true. Yeah, and, and now, um, I was curious, Dan, getting back to your um, EP, like, another thing that um, I was very interested that you were saying is um, when, when this EP comes out, it's not necessarily going to be um, totally, like, um, based around the guitar. Now, on that note, I was curious, are you a true solo artist in the sense that um, you're going to also be playing the bass and the drum parts, or are you going to bring other guys in to do those those parts? Well, that now, yeah. So up until now, and on the EP, I I, I just play all the instruments. But yeah. Um, but yeah, that is something that I really want to do at some point, which yeah. is bring in a drummer, bring in a bass player, bring in uh, you know those people. And 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 actually, I have been thinking about that after this EP yeah. for my next project. That's actually what I what I plan to do. And so and also because you know with touring and stuff in mind. Yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm going to need to get in with, because I, I know a lot of musicians in Sacramento, but they, you know, tremendous players, like I was talking about that drummer, for example, yeah. uh, but, you know, he's got his whole life up there, it's like, yeah. uh, he's kind of doing his own thing, and so, um, and that's a guy who plays in, like, now I think he plays, I don't know about now, but yeah. the last time I heard, he was playing, like, four bands at the same time, like, wow, he just wow. always he, wants to be Oh, that, that guy, I guess, is very much in demand, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well... You know, it's it's you know, good drummers are always hard to find, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, he's you know, like as professional as they get, and just uh, whatever. But uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, that's definitely something I'd like to do. And so I need to. It's funny because I've lived yeah. in Southern California now for probably like five years or so. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, and yeah, you know, it's I've just been so. And you know, I, like when I first got down here, I was you know working with a lot of people doing like for like with gear companies and stuff, promoting mm-hmm. like a guitar or a you know uh-huh. a, like a pedal or a tuner or something. Yeah. And, things like that kind of paying the bills at the time uh, you're helping to but um uh, but i didn't really do a lot of uh of uh you know uh, networking with other musicians uh like i used to do and it's yeah. funny just being in la there's just you know it's the yeah and it's amazing too it. well you know you, you might um you might be surprised that um 
um, it, it, especially like you'd be surprised Facebook and you know other sources on the internet if you just reach out to people you'd be amazed with um, the talent you'd find out there oh I believe it I believe it and that, that's actually precisely what I'm going to going to do once the EP is done uh, is uh, and also to the people I yeah. do know kind of just put the feelers out there And <laughs> but yeah I, you're right I mean it's, there's so many talented musicians out there players of various instruments and, it, and it, yeah it's like everybody's looking for a, a gig to work on yeah 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 now, now um, before you wrap this up, um, two more things I do, do kind of want to touch on. Now, um, we've been talking a little bit about um, the fact that um, you haven't performed in a, uh, quite a while. So, um, how excited are you to, um, you know, when the opportunity presents itself and the EP is ready to be released, to, to, to do start doing live shows? I mean, and and, and I was kind of curious. Um, do, you, do you think you're going to need a lot of practice um, before you hit, you know, start the touring process? <clears throat> Well, yeah, so I'm, I'm super excited about that. I mean, I've been itching to do that for way too long now. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think, like, because I've been quite performing so sporadically uh, over the mm -hmm. last few years, every time I have performed, uh -huh. it's required quite a bit of practice ahead of time. So, yeah, I do think there's going to be, I'm going to have to set aside a period of time, probably like a month, just uh -huh. to feel really comfortable with it, um, to just really dedicate to... Uh, to getting my chops to where I want them to be uh, for for performance, but obviously, uh, yeah, there's a uh, 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 yeah, it's, yeah, huge you know excitement factor. I think the fact you know you haven't played in, you know live in front of people that that's got to be a huge excitement thing. That that okay, yeah, I'm gonna finally get get a chance to do this. Well, like I was, and exactly like what I was saying before too is is uh, the last time I was performing regularly, I was playing a lot of music that just wasn't really fun for me to perform yeah. and so performing on stage is one of my favorite things to do in the world and that actually threatened like to kill my passion for it you know it uh -huh. just uh it just felt so much like just working you know um so uh, so yeah i'm really excited about playing these newer songs which are you know I, i've been writing them with performance in mind now yeah. and i think uh that's yeah so i'm very very excited about that and as far as the set list obviously you'll be playing stuff off the new um ep but um like well, you have a lot. Of, you have like a lot of older material that you'd be playing as well. Yeah, yeah. It'll probably be. Uh, yeah, would, uh, probably more than half would be older stuff, but yeah. probably the Western Wind would be in there because that one people really seem to like that one. And then a glimpse beyond is, is probably still the most popular of my original songs. It's, yeah. it's from my first album, wow. and that's quite a ways back now. But I think 2011 or something. And that's uh, my, uh, that's yeah, my next so, question. If people want to check out like some of your um, your past. Um, Past music, like, um, can they still go on the, can they still go on your official site and um, purchase CDs and that? So I'm, I'm currently out. I just ended up selling the last CD that I have had in stock. Uh, okay. So I, yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I plan to have more printed. I, I just have to, you know, kind of so many things going on. It's hard to. Yeah, keep, yeah, yeah. yeah. Stay on top but of but in the meantime, people can follow you on your Facebook page, and you're always um, yeah, putting stuff up there. Facebook, uh, I have. Most of the music can be heard on YouTube, uh, but then Spotify. Uh, Spotify doesn't have songs from the last couple of years, mm -hmm. but uh, but it's got everything else. And then uh, iTunes has you know pretty much the same selection, a little more selection than Spotify. But yeah, I mean it's it's out there uh, on quite a few. And so like people go to iTunes, they can actually um, purchase purchase some of this stuff. Yeah, all my albums and the one EP that I've released uh, so far are on iTunes right now. Uh, and I'm thinking about because I've, I've had I've released so many songs as like singles yeah. that I'm selling through a a, a third party digital uh, site called Selfie, which is located out of uh, Northern Europe, and it's a great platform for wow. for selling music or any other kind of digital thing. But it, yeah, but over the last uh, couple of years since my last album, I, I put out like maybe you know a little over a dozen songs wow. that are not on an album, and so. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I, I'm thinking I may release like a collection of those songs before I put the EP out, just so that those are available to people. Yeah, people can uh, check out, okay, this is what I've done before, and, and, and wait till you see what's next, you know? Right, totally. totally. And then the final thing I want to uh, touch base on, Dan, before we wrap this up, is you were mentioning, um, and i seen some on the Facebook page about the fact that um, you have a signature guitar model. That's that's pretty. That's a pretty cool thing for an independent artist to have okay. your signature model. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I was really excited about that. 
Yeah, actually, I was contacted, I think it was just a couple years ago now, by Keith Greeson, just this really cool guy, amazing luthier. Uh, and, uh, and he, you know, he's kind of like a boutique workshop, you know, out of Arizona. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, he's uh, basically through uh, a guy by the name of Jose from a pickup company called Planet Tone, who also does my custom pickups for me. Also another really cool, amazingly talented guy. Um, and so they just kind of got together, contacted with me, and we set up this whole thing. And so, yeah, so now there's the Dan Mum signature guitar, which is actually a guitar that I've been kind of playing with that you know every guitarist has like their custom guitar in mind you know since day one and yeah so yeah this was this design that had been like you know evolving over all these years and it's somewhere in between like a uh, rickenbacker 440 like 1960s you know old rickenbacker and like a parker which i used to play parker guitars uh, oh, wow. with some elements of other other guitars in there but yeah, it's it was so cool to actually, I mean, to, to see this thing come into life the first time, and like, uh, and then actually hold it and play it. It's just such a great instrument. But yeah, you can actually buy the Dan Mum signature guitar through Grease and Custom Guitars, and I think about seven people have bought them so far, which is really cool. Like, uh, so there are people out there. Um, one guy, I think, in Germany. One guy in Italy. You know, some people from the U.S., guy from Canada, and it's like with this guitar. To me, it's just the coolest thing. And now, let me ask you, Dan, how does a deal like that work? So, this is the Dan Mum signature guitar. So, when people purchase this stuff, um, do you do you do you get to split the profit with the guy that designed it, or uh, I mean, how does that work? So, yeah. So, right now, we worked out a, a kind of a simpler deal because. Uh, just to kind of get things off off the ground. Obviously, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, so right now it's just uh, he, like I'm not I'm not asking for any any cash from it. I, I hear, Although I hear. we're planning on doing that as things pick up in the future. Yeah, yeah. But right now it's just you know custom guitars work that kind of stuff. So um, I, I, I have the first one now, and then hopefully I think sometime this year I'll be getting the second one. Um, and then uh, we're going to be like doing three right off the bat. They're all slightly different, like different colors. Yeah, yeah. Themes. And stuff like that. So yeah. So right now, to me, that's just worth so much. You know. I mean, I mean it's, it's cool great. because you're an independent artist, and there's not a lot of independent artists that have a signature model. I mean, you know, we've all heard like Michael Schenker, uh, you know, Richie Blackmore signature model. But that's got to be um, as an artist, that's got to be a cool thing to have your own um, signature guitar. It's amazing. It's, it really is amazing, and it, it, it's also just great uh, from kind of the promotional side of things. It's, yeah. it's great to have that you know unique look that is kind of a branded thing now so yeah. you know it's it's when people right. see the guitar they can you know kind of relate it and and so, remember, yeah, I mean, remember the name <laughs> yeah right, exactly <laughs> so, yeah as an independent artist it's just it's a boon absolutely yeah. like uh, i was just you know it was one of those things when, yeah. when they first contacted me about it i was a little bit leery because i've had a lot of people contact me about various things with when it comes to guitars and i, I was a parker artist for a long time but that's that's a quite a you know, jump from that to like having a custom signature guitar. So, um, so yeah, it was kind of like I had various people contact me, but it was always, you know, uh, there was always some kind of catch to it that mm-hmm. was not uh, on the up and up. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, when this started panning out, I was, I was, I was pretty skeptical at first, and then, yeah, I, I was blown away. Just uh, very, very happy about that. Well, well, I'd like to thank my uh, new friend Dan Mum for talk, uh, taking time out of his very busy schedule to talk to us today, and. Um, Dan, when you're ready to release the EP, we'll, we'll do this again. Um, I want to give a huge shout-out to um, your publicist, um, Phil Vandenberg from uh, Vandenberg P- um, PR, and also our mutual friend, um, Max Carlisle, for hooking us up. Um, thanks so much for doing this, um, Dan. I really appreciate it. And uh, the interview will probably be going up about a week. I'll let, you, I'll let you and Phil know the minute it goes up, okay? Okay, that's great. Yeah, thank you, Jason, too. I really appreciate this. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I'll, yeah, looking forward to the next time. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. All right, you too.